Well, thank you so much. I'm, uh, I'm actually really excited to be here because the modeling methodology that I use is in some ways derived from the uh, sort of um, uh, thinking around uh, process controls uh, and actually uh, came out of that community about 50 or so years ago. So I'm going to put up a slide here, and I want to know if you guys can tell me what this is. Just shout it out. It's PNID. And can you tell me what's in this PNID? What are these? What's this? Do I have a laser pen? All right, so tell me what this is here. What is it? It's some sort of heat exchanger, yeah, with a little squiggle. What's this? This is some sort of tank. All right, and what have I got? What are these uh, right here? What's that? It's a valve. OK, so the valves control the flow from the tanks through to the other tanks, and, uh, and the process is the flow there. Um, so, so what do you think this is a system of? What, what is the, this a diagram? What does it represent? It's hard to tell. It's a little fuzzy. So this is uh, a brewery in uh, Bend, Oregon. This is the Crow's Feed Brewing Company. And that diagram that we saw shows, in some ways, the way that the different components of that system, the beer system, flow from one tank to another, one category to another. And the modeling methodology that I use, called system dynamics, looks kind of similar. So what you can see here is I've got some, uh, some boxes. And those kind of represent the tanks that we saw in the previous diagram. And I've got some valves right there. And so there's a flow into that, that stock. And then there's some lines which represent sort of information links, which uh, drive the, the feedback structures, which, which drive the system's behavior. So what is this a model of? This isn't a model of a physical system. This is a model of a social system. So what our modeling does is it takes this methodology that we've used to apply to a, an engineered top-down system and says, what if we apply it to an emergent system that arises due to the interaction of human beings? We don't get to control what this system looks like, but we still want to have some influence on the way it behaves. So here's a little story model here. There's no real simulation I'm going to show you, but I'll talk you through what's happening. This is a model of the pressures that are present on a cyber criminal organization and the way that they use cyber vulnerabilities to further their, uh, their, their, uh, their, their process. So what are they trying to do? They're trying to uh, infect computers to, to generate some sort of income. So I'm just going to throw out there what happens if, for some reason, their income drops dramatically. Just one day, they, they start to lose maybe a fifth of their income. So uh, if, if the total number of computers that they've lost, I'm sorry, if that drops by a fifth, then their income's going to drop as well. And they're going to be under some pressure, because they've got, uh, they're trying to, to pay themselves. They're probably working with some other people that are expecting uh, funds from them. So they've got a lot of pressure to increase their ability to conduct these exploits. And because of this pressure, they're going to be investing in new capability. They're going to be buying cyber vulnerabilities on the black market. And they're also going to be spreading the target that, uh, that they're, they're hacking. So you might say, uh, let's first start hacking targets in countries that have uh, poor controls on cybersecurity. So we'll look at those first. And then we'll sort of spread out from there. Maybe we'll look in places where we know that law enforcement pressure is weak. And so if we hack those computers, then there's not likely to be much, uh, much comeback to us. And this, of course, increases their ability to, uh, to attack and increases the, the, the spread of the targets they have, which in some senses increases their ability to exploit new computers and increases the number of infections they've made. So this is a balancing feedback loop. We talk about this all the time in process controls. And this balancing feedback loop is their way of, of, of bringing their system into a line with their goals. They're trying to make sure that they can generate this income. But as we all know, any system is present of a larger system, which it interacts with. And in this case, that larger system involves the vendors of these pieces of software that are being attacked. And the broader your uh, attack base is, the more computers that you're trying to infect, and uh, the, the more um, ca casual you are, the more careless you are with the way you make those attacks, the more visible you become to security professionals. And so what does that do? That increases the uh, patching rate, the effort that's put into fixing those particular pieces of software. And so what effect does that have? That, I'm sorry, went too fast. That uh, increases, let's walk around this again, I'm sorry. That increases the, uh, the number of patching that happens and decreases the, the uh, install base, the, the hack base, if you will, of, of uh, that cyber criminal organization. So what else does it do? It also increases this law enforcement pressure. 
And um, the, uh, the law enforcement is acting to, uh, to, to bring these cyber criminals to justice, and this could take many forms. Um, it takes the form of let's go out and find the guys who are responsible for this and arrest them. It takes the form of let's pass new reg leg legislation, which uh, encourages these people not to be participating in this particular enterprise. So I want to uh, make this concrete. There was a particular instance where this exact system was, uh, was operational. There was a, a black hole exploit kit came out of Russia a few years ago. I think uh, there was, uh, what have I got here? I got uh, 2007, no, what is that? Scales on this are, are all off, I'm sorry. I think it was uh, all the way through 2011. And what happened was that uh, originally this, this exploit kit contained a number of vulnerabilities and allowed this, this uh, cyber criminal organization to infect a number of computers. And they were doing great. The pressure was you know, relatively low for them to, to increase their capability or to increase their attack spread until, you know, just due to chance, things started to get patched. And so the total number of infections that they uh, had outstanding started to decrease. And so we just talked about what would happen if that was the case. The pressure would increase to uh, invest in these new attack capability, and the pressure increases to spread the target that you're looking at. And so what you can see here is in this red line, as the number of infections starts to decline and that pressure grows, this cyber criminal organization uh, says, we're going we're gonna to buy cyber vulnerabilities in the black market, and the amount of money that we're willing to spend on these is going to increase. And so as, as this pressure builds, they spend more and more and more trying to keep that capability alive, that ability to infect new computers. And what you don't have a chart for, because it sort of happens in the background, is, is this target spread and that, that corresponding law enforcement pressure. So this was a group that was operating out of Russia, and originally their target spread had been entirely on uh, Western machines, so things in the United States, things in Western Europe, um, and, and they weren't really attracting much attention from any law enforcement, uh, and they were doing just fine. But as this pressure grew on them to increase their target spread, they started to look at machines in countries that were more closely associated with their own and they started to attract uh, law enforcement attention. And what actually ended up happening was right at the time that this chart runs out, it was like November of 2011, something along those lines, this uh, entire group uh, gets arrested by the Russian government. This is their leader, Ponch, is the, uh, the, the code handle. So this is just a, a little story uh, to tell you a little bit about how our model modeling methodology works and how we apply it to those social systems. I'm going to go ahead and look at a, a, a different system now that we can sort of interact with together and talk about. So uh, when we're looking at cyber vulnerabilities, there's a number of different things that come into making a vulnerability possible. I'm sorry, an, an exploit possible. So first you have to have some vulnerable uh, system. There has to be uh, a vulnerability in it. I'm sorry, a valuable system and a vulnerability in that system. And then there has to be some sort of capability to take that exploit and turn it into, uh, take that vulnerability and turn it into an exploit. And then the system itself has to fail to respond to that in a graceful way. And what I want to do is, is mostly look at this, uh, this component here, vulnerabilities. And there's a lot of different ways that we can define what a vulnerability means. And I'm not going to tell you which one is the best, but I'm going to tell you which one I'm going to use for the purposes of this presentation. Um, and what we're going to talk about a vulnerability meaning is a s series of inputs into the system that, when they are executed, uh, cause the system to uh, reveal hidden information, to impair its own functionality, or to cause damage to itself or something else. And this has a really nice property. This, this definition allows us to say that the total number of vulnerabilities is finite. Now, we could use a different definition of vulnerabilities, which said that a vulnerability is a human error, and we know that there are an infinite number of ways that humans can make errors. But if, there's, uh, if we're making the assumption that a hacker is, is interacting with our system through uh, a remote access point, so there's a, some sort of baud rate, some bandwidth that they're able to communicate with us, and we know that you know, at the fundamental level, they can only send either a 1 or a 0 in each timestamp, each, uh, each, each set of time then that's a finite number of ways that they can communicate with our system. So this allows us to conceptualize vulnerabilities as a finite stock. So what's really important here is not just the number of vulnerabilities that exist in the, the system, but the number of uh, undiscovered vulnerabilities and how that interacts with the, the larger ecosystem. 
And when we want to track the, the number of something in system dynamics, we put a box around it, just like this. And we can draw flows in and out of that stock. So this is, as we saw in the previous diagrams, ways of, of looking at the flow of vulnerabilities. So in this case, the number of undisclosed, undiscovered vulnerabilities can be reduced by patching efforts. So if, as Michael talked about, the vendor uh, releases a patch, you might uh, try very hard to push that patch out to all your systems. That reduces the total number of undisclosed, discovered vulnerabilities. The other thing that can happen is that uh, a vulnerability can be discovered by an offensive act, uh, actor, uh, a black hat actor, if you want. And when these are discovered, they move into a stockpile that can be used for offensive purposes. And I'll say that this, this offensive stockpile is probably what represents the, uh, the risk factor to, uh, to third parties, not to vendors, but to the people who are actually using the piece of software. And the reason for that is that this, in some sense, is where zero-day vulnerabilities come from, where zero-day attacks come from. If there are a million vulnerabilities in your piece of software, but the hackers don't know about any of them, then you're doing OK. You're not likely to be attacked. But if there are 10 vulnerabilities in your piece of uh, software, and the attackers know about all 10 of them, then you may have a big trouble. So how does this uh, reduce? First, we can patch from that, that stock as well. Um, but also, uh, when, when vulnerabilities are, are used in zero-day exploits, we'll call them deployed, then we'll reduce this stock of, of the offensive stockpile. So what, um, what causes that, that rate of discovery to, to be what it is? How do we know what's causing that? Clearly, there's some sort of capacity that these black hat actors have to discover undiscovered vulnerabilities and move them into their stockpile. And this is going to be due to the total number of hackers who are participating in that space. And it's also going to be due to their uh, capabilities, their individual average skill sets. And so the way this changes is through people leaving, or sorry, I'm sorry, people learning about how to, uh, to make these attacks. And it also changes as they bring people who know how to do it into this circle of black hat attackers. And of course, they can leave that circle, and they, their skills erode over time. So what do I mean by erode over time? That's actually pretty important, too. Um, we know that uh, the, the, the skills that it takes to, to break into a system are dependent on not just your knowledge of, of computer systems in general, or your ability to debug or find errors, or even your ability to craft exploits, but it's also due to your deep understanding of the system that you're trying to infect. And in many situations, we find that these systems have a relatively fast turnover. So you might say the code base for the Chrome browser uh, turns over relatively quickly. Um, any piece of code that is in there is going to be in there for, uh, I think, it's orders of, of a few years, um, just because it's a piece of software that's actively and currently being developed. So if you're a hacker who's trying to understand the system and get deeply into its core workings, you're going to have to be spending a lot of time keeping up with the changes in that code base. Now, in some industrial control systems, this might not be the case. We have pieces of software that are deployed for decades. It makes it a lot easier for hackers to acquire the knowledge that it takes to get deep into those systems. So this is an interesting uh, component of the dynamic system. There's also the motivation of those particular hackers to get into these pieces of software. And in a lot of cases, this is uh, financial, because you can't, if you're a black hat actor, go out and put this on your resume. I, I hacked into uh, the a control plant for uh, an oil refinery. It's not something that people generally smile at. Um, so, so you're doing this for money. And there's clearly a black market for these vulnerabilities that allow uh, state actors or other uh, uh, criminal organizations to, to buy those vulnerabilities and use them for their own purposes. And those two together control the rate of discovery. So looking at some data here, I just mentioned the, this, this overall uh, 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 career length of a security researcher, a, a black hat hacker, say. Um, and I said that this was dependent upon the size of the code base and the code base turnover. So what you see here is a chart of the, the career trajectories of, uh, I think it's 180 of the top bug finders in Microsoft products. And of course, this data comes from white hat sources. So these are all people who have disclosed the vulnerabilities they've found. But what you see is that uh, I've, I've normalized it by the, their peak productivity and then stuck everyone on the same axis so you can chart them all together. But what you sort of see here is that people spend some time raising their productivity. And there's some point, uh, maybe 
somewhere between one and three years after they sort of get into this space that they're really in their prime and they're finding the largest number of vulnerabilities that they can find. This is because they've become really familiar with the piece of software that they're looking at. But then after a while, they peek out, and after another two or three years, their skills have eroded to the point where they're no longer participating in these, uh, in these, uh, these activities. So maybe this is entirely due to skill erosion. Maybe it's due to uh, they, they get jobs in other places and their interests change. But you can sort of see here a general outline for, uh, for Microsoft products, at least, what this career lifestyle of these vulnerability uh, uh, researchers looks like. OK, so back to the model. Uh, we've talked about the black hat's capability. Let's also talk about the white hat capability. So these are people who are finding uh, vulnerabilities in, say, as we just saw, Microsoft products, even though they're not working for Microsoft, and they're not selling them on the black market. So what are they doing with them? In a lot of cases, they're, they're maybe they're hobbyists. Maybe they work, uh, they have other jobs, but this is something that they find to be personally fulfilling, and they're really interested in it. So they're looking for vulnerabilities as well. And when they find these vulnerabilities, they submit them to the vendors. And there's a variety of different ways that this can happen, and I'm not going to get into the huge depth of, of disclosure uh, uh, complexity. But let's just go ahead and say that when a vulnerability is found by a white hat actor, it leads to patching. And of course, we have the motivation behavior here as well. Now in this case, patching can come, as we saw from before, from either these undiscovered vulnerabilities or from that offensive stockpile. But we don't necessarily know uh, what that ratio is. So we'll come to that in just a sec. But first of all, how can we influence the decision of these uh, white hat actors to find vulnerabilities for us? So we could influence their motivation by adding a, a bounty, say, for uh, the, the disclosure, a responsible disclosure of a vulnerability in a vendor's piece of software. So Microsoft has in the past offered money for uh, people who are in this white hat category to submit vulnerabilities that they find. Um, and then there are a few third party programs like the Zero Day Initiative, which work to uh, sort of be a, a third party intermediary between uh, uh, vendors and these vulnerability researchers. We could also influence the rate of learning of this category of white hat actors by, say, offering uh, training in how to discover vulnerabilities or in how to report these vulnerabilities to the, the vendors uh, or how to just generally use computers in a way to build up the, the initial stock of people who have the capability to get involved in this in the first place. Another thing we could do would be to try to encourage people who are acting in a black hat way to leave this profession. So we could either you know, arrest them or we could give them jobs. And both of those would serve this, this task of trying to get people who are acting in a black hat capacity to, to leave that, that occupation. Sure thing, Michael. Do you, uh, do you want a microphone? Oh, yes, and, uh, I'm sorry. Just to add, just, just to add context to this, um, in addition to all the bug bounty programs that run all the time, there's one day a year, uh, Pwn to Own and Ponium, which are two contests held on basically one day at a conference. And the prize money now is over $4 million. It's divided among different awards. But everyone who enters the, the contest has to give up their vulnerability at the end of the day. That is, they, they goes back to the vendor. But the winners of the contest walk away with, uh, I think the, the largest is in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So this is starting to be serious money, again, in the context of software. But there's no reason why it has to stop there. There's no reason why. So it's a crowdsourcing way of reducing this pool of dangerous things that are out there and getting them into the right the right hands. So the context just is, is serious money now. Thanks, Michael. Um, when we're looking at here the, the, the patching process, and we want to know how does our patching influence that number of, of vulnerabilities in the offensive stockpile. If we patch something out of the undiscovered vulnerabilities, it decreases the ability of a, a, a black hat actor to find a new vulnerability, but it doesn't decrease directly the number that they already have in their stockpile. And what we need to do in order for that to be the case is to actually find a vulnerability that they've already found. And so what we're looking at here is the correlation between vulnerabilities that are found by white hat actors and the vulnerabilities that are found by black hat actors. So I want to um, give a little, little, little uh, demonstration of what I mean by that correlation. So assume, say, we have some space of vulnerabilities or space of code base maybe where vulnerabilities could be found. 
And for the sake of argument, let's say that black hat actors find all of the vulnerabilities in this lower quadrant, and say that white hat actors find all of the vulnerabilities in that blue quadrant. Now this sort of represents the case that there are, there's no correlation whatsoever between the vulnerabilities that are found by one group and the vulnerabilities that are found by the other. So it's sort of random. And what this means is that we're just as likely to find a vulnerability uh, that the uh, black hat actors have also found as we are to find a general vulnerability. Now if we increase the correlation, say if we start looking in the same places that the black hat actors are looking, then by finding exactly the same number of vulnerabilities, we can reduce that stock of ones in the offensive stockpile. So this is some correlation between the two, and you can see that now I have actually found maybe 50% of the vulnerabilities that the black hat actors have found. And if I had almost perfect correlation, then this would allow me to deploy the minimum number of resources in finding vulnerabilities, but have the maximum return on, uh, on patching. OK, so now what I want to do, and we'll see if this works, I hope so, is I want to jump over to a simulation. So let's see. Can I slide this over here? No, OK. Let me try something else. Um, great. OK. All right, cross your fingers, everyone. Let's hope this works. OK, so here I have my model. Does this look sort of familiar? So this is the same model that we were just looking at before. And what I've done is I've, I've added some equations that, that describe the dynamics of this process. And I've added, you can see these little sliders here. And these sliders allow me to adjust the, the processes that are in, going on. So right here I have this learning and recruitment for black hat actors. Here I have this learning and recruitment for white hat actors. And I have this discovery correlation right here. So right now my discovery correlation is set to be something that is really quite low. So if I have low discovery correlation, this is something we don't know. We don't know right away if a vulnerability that I find is likely to be found by somebody else or not. This is an, a hidden parameter. But let's see how that hidden parameter influences uh, the way we should make our decisions. So starting with a low discovery correlation, what happens if I increase the rate at which I uh, bring in white hat hackers? So as you see, as I slide the slider over, those charts that are up on the right-hand side are changing. And the top chart is that offensive stockpile. So our goal here is to minimize that offensive stockpile altogether. All right. So what you see is that as I increase the, the uh, recruitment for that white hat set of actors, I'm actually able to bring down that offensive stockpile. And let's talk about why that's happening. So let me see if I can uh, hover over this. Can you see sort of what's going on there? As I increase those number of, of, uh, of hackers, oh, I'm sorry, of white hat hackers, uh, I've, I've increased, it's gone now, I've increased the number straight away of, of patching from that, that stockpile. Uh, but over time, the total number of, of vulnerabilities coming out of that stockpile returns to where it was before. So why is this? What does this mean? I've increased the number of people who are looking for these vulnerabilities, and I've only had a temporary effect. I've gone back to essentially where I was before. And this is, as we saw before, essentially due to this discovery correlation. So if I move this slider all the way over like this, OK, and I've got some weird behavior going on there, but I'll just sort of ignore that for now. And I'll put this back where it was down here, OK? So now what's happening? I'm increasing my white hat capacity, but when I go back to this stockpiling here, this patching from that stockpile, straight away, I'm sorry, you're having a hard time seeing that, you'll see there's a spike in the total number of, uh, of uh, 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 patching from that vulnerability stockpile. But then the rate at which I'm able to consistently discover new vulnerabilities from that stockpile this is really quite hard to see on the screen. I'm sorry, you're, you're having a hard time seeing that. Well, I'll tell you, I'll talk to you through what's happening. Is the rate at which I'm able to discover those vulnerabilities from that stockpile has returned to flat again, but it's higher than it was in the previous case. And so what this says is that in situations where we can expect a high correlation between the vulnerabilities that I'm finding and the vul vulnerabilities that the black hat actors are finding, then I should work hard to increase the rate at which I'm able to uh, bring people onto my team in some sense, add bounty programs, uh, for the purpose of attracting white hat actors or ad training for the purpose of, of adding white hat actors. Now let's go back to that other case with low vulnerability discovery correlation and see what I can make happen. In this case, we know that this white hat learning and recruitment lever is relatively weak. It doesn't have a huge impact. And this is because, as again, we're discovering very few of those vulnerabilities that are also found by the black hat actors. 
But what could happen if I could decrease the average length of the career of a black hat actor? So I've got a little slider here that lets us do that. And let's see what happens. OK. So right here, I've got a, a uh, graph which shows that, that uh, average black hat capacity. And because I've decreased the rate, sorry, the, um, the, the career length, what happens essentially is that the total uh, steady state number of black hat hackers decreases. The total capacity of those black hat hackers decreases. And so this tells us that in a situation in which uh, rediscovery or this uh, discovery correlation between white hat and black hat actors is low, then what I might want to do is put my resources less into attracting new people to uh, participate in white hat uh, 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 discovery of, of vulnerabilities, but I might want to put it into, say, turning my code base over more regularly so that those black hat uh, hackers uh, skill out over time. All right, so I'm going to go back to the presentation, if I can find it. There we go. And this is what I want to leave you with. Um, there's a, a great quote which we use uh, every, every semester we teach the, the class on this modeling methodology to the, the Sloan uh, MBA students and the other business students at MIT. And one of the first things we say on the first day of class is that all the models that we're going to build in this semester are wrong. But some of them are useful. And this comes back to the things we were talking about before, is that when we start with a question, in this case the question was, how should we best deploy our resources to minimize the total number of, uh, of vul vulnerabilities in that offensive stockpile, then we can build a model which is scoped around those components. We know this model has issues. It doesn't have any ways of talking about the cross-feed between the two ha uh, hacker groups. It doesn't have any way of talking about uh, the motivations of those individuals. But it does give us this ability to look at that particular question in depth. So our research for, for going forward into the next year is going to be asking, now that we have some traction on these particular questions, what are the new questions that we should be asking with our models? And what do we need to change about our models? What new data do we need to acquire in order to be able to answer them properly? So that should be a great lead into questions. Thank you so much. and things like that. Are there any questions directly for James? Uh, in particular, I want, I want to tr what I wanted to do here, what I hope we're doing here, is it talks a lot about software and vulnerabilities in that space. I want to take the leap that says, what does this mean in a control system environment as, an indus as particular industries, as, as particular installations? Are we able to identify the software vendors that we have and what they're doing with their vulnerability markets, and are we able to identify inside of our own environments whether we should be collecting, reducing the number of exposures across industry as a, as a particular uh, organization, and do any of these types of efforts and analyses apply to that? So it's a lot in one sentence, I know. But if there are any questions for James with regard to this work, let's do uh, those now while we're switching over speakers. Great. I just, I just have a general question for the group. Um, do we really want to encourage hackers to learn zero days on ICS systems? Uh, what would be the advantage of that? I realize that argument, but I would just say we just learned from the model that we increase the number of uh, uh, encouraged hackers will increase their population, which no doubt ultimately will increase the number of vulnerabilities researched in this area. So I just I wanted to float that idea. I didn't want to come up with an answer here, but uh, I think that all vendors should consider carefully <laughs> before they go into like a bug bounty type methodology or something like that because the assertion that oh somebody will find them um, remember that ICS is a relatively small portion of the overall space of information uh, systems of systems that are out there granted it's a rare event that can have a huge impact but if you think about the, the hacking of financial systems, probably is a much better 
avenue for avarice and acquisition of wealth rather than, than hacking into a natural gas plant. So I just would like to throw that out that, you know, one of the reasons why ICS probably is less targeted is because of its profile. So as we would think about motivating people to do research in this area, you know, we have to think about that. Now, I'm not talking about academic research so much as I'm talking about where we would actually offer re, uh, rewards to, uh, what would you call it, irregular actors in this kind of information uh, economy. So I just wanted to throw that out. other people. The stuff that makes the news are the, are the flashy uh, stuff like stuck nets and, and things that came up in the past, but I, I would argue that there's probably industrial espionage that's going on, um, that there's intellectual property. Um, one thing I've noted in this meeting, and um, I'm with 3M, Bill, and I work with Bill, a lot of the discussion that goes on here tends to be targeted toward the chemical industry and the oil and gas industry, but there's a, there's a whole other piece of industry out there, and a big chunk of it is actually down at the convention center this weekend. This is role converting and coding and other stuff. You know, we, we, make, we make a lot of stuff that goes into these kind of things that other people want to know how it's done. And um, I think if we don't do something to try and figure out the vulnerabilities, it's like proofreading your own work, right? You write code and you try and protect it, but unless somebody else is looking at it with the intention of trying to find the errors, in your, in your, you know, you need a good editor. Um, we may not see them ourselves. I think this is a really interesting point because, in some senses, it comes to the core of what happens when a vulnerability is discovered by uh, somebody who would consider themselves a good guy. Does it actually decrease the ability of those third-party actors to find a new vulnerability via one of two mechanisms? One being removing something from a stock that they could go on to discover in the future, or removing ones that they've already found. Um, and I think the best way that we can answer this is by really going uh, deeply into that, that data set, and that's something that, that I haven't actually been able to do yet. Um, so future research should hopefully uh, shed some light on that question. So thank you so much. I actually think that, um, to your point, uh, taking advantage of the cloud sourcing white hat environment is going to work in the favor for ICS. So because, as you said, uh, process industry probably isn't as good of a target or a, a lower value target than the financial industry because money, not money, directly, right? That you're going to get a higher percentage of white hat activity than black hat activity even if you invite it. This certainly stimulates some conversation and I guess the one thing that I was thinking in this whole conversation, Paul kind of got to it a little bit, is that I'm really thankful for uh, bank card fraud. Um, it really distracted a lot of the amateurs and everyone else from, you know, going, it used to be just random hacking going on, and we're still vulnerable to that, but, you know, we've done some things to protect ourselves a little bit from just rank amateurs. But what we do have is we do have intellectual property, we have some high value intellectual property. And if that means, you know, talking to the longevity of the hackers, uh, they can buy all the same equipment I can, and they're gonna get paid by states to develop the, or steal the technology rather than develop it. So now I'm not working with an amateur, I'm working against real professionals who are really digging in there and getting into things. And obviously, stuck nuts is one of those things that shows what happens when. Uh, people put their mind to something, they can come up with something, and I'll say truly beautiful in its, in its approach to what it did. So, so uh, this is Ed Crawford Chevron, and Jeff brings up a good point, uh, but uh, I really am in favor of the white hats that are looking at vulnerabilities in the uh, technologies that we have no control over, and that's the Windows OS. Uh, 
in the areas like applications being developed by our automation suppliers, we have capabilities of strengthening those without going to external white hat or black hat uh, vulnerability exposures. And that's like the ISA Secure. Now this is a pitch for, for the ISA Security Compliance Organization, which is supportive of the standards that are developed by IEC 62443 where we can look for vulnerabilities and in that space and strengthen our applications that we have some control over. So uh, that's something that I think that is not then exposed to the public. This is a great point, I think. And, and we saw that with the Stuxnet case, was that there were vulnerabilities that were both in the Windows uh, systems that were being used and also the, the hardware controllers. And so, as you say, the, those different regimes might have different approaches, which would be more appropriate. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to, and um, uh, Andy Chera here, I, I'd like to comment. I think one of the issue with our industry is even the biggest companies right now, you, you talk to them, in fact, they are not actually investing a lot in cybersecurity. They are using cybersecurity software from very small companies. <laughs> in fact, most of the cy cybersecurity <laughs> software is coming from a couple of very small companies, and all the big guys are essentially embedding their software into their products. So, so uh, unfortunately, uh, it's really it's a problem with our industry right now because some of those big guys really got to stand up and take a little more responsibility and try to actually, you know, invest more trying to secure their systems. So I, I, first I want to mention this is a great discussion. We have lots more to talk about, obviously. We encourage you all to interact with us. Our, our website, ic3.mit.edu. I'm happy to, to email with any of you and continue this conversation. I think there are very clear discussions we ha can have with any number of organizations in this room around this and other topics we present. But for the sake of time today, because we have a panel also coming up, I want to thank James. Thank Very you, nice job in presenting that. And I want to introduce uh, Michael Coden. <laughs>